Would you be shocked to learn that a bunch of recovering alcoholics and addicts would like to rent the house next door to you? Well, the man who would like to make that happen is Paul Malloy. Why does he want to put those people next door to you? And who is he anyway? Let me read a description of you that I read. Former drinker of two-fifths of Canadian Club a day, former wife beater, former mental patient, former street drunk. True? Yes, I think. All of those things occurred, you know, before I finally stopped drinking. Paul Malloy and his wife Jane were two ambitious kids from Vermont who wanted to make their mark in Washington. Malloy hit the halls of Congress by day and the bottle by day and night. He thought he was smart enough to become the world's first successful practicing alcoholic. I had sort of been the yuppie of my day, I suppose, in the, in the late 60s, in that I was Republican counsel of the Senate Commerce Committee and had uh, gotten involved in creating Amtrak and a lot of federal election campaign had a lot of important legislation. All the time you were drunk? Yeah, yeah. Malloy's yeah. wife divorced him, and he ended up on the street. Finally, in an effort to get help, he went into treatment and then checked into a halfway house only to find out the house was about to shut down. He and the other residents, afraid they might relapse without the house, decided to rent it themselves. Then they did something unheard of. They decided to run it themselves. No staff, no paid counselors. It was called Oxford House. It was such a success that Malloy and his friends opened another house, and then another and another. Fifteen years later, there are more than 200 around the country, and over 6,000 people have lived in them. Malloy heads up the central office, but the homes themselves are run by the residents, all of them former drunks and addicts, like these men in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. What Oxford House gives them, they say, is time. We said that once you got into this house, you could live there the rest of your life if you didn't drink, didn't use drugs, and paid your weekly share of expenses. Those were the three key rules? Those were the three key rules. The average stay in each of the 200 Oxford houses is 15 months. While there, most of the residents go to almost daily support group meetings like Alcoholics Anonymous. And everyone must hold down a job to pay his share of the rent, utilities, and food. Since each house is self-supporting, everyone pitches in, which is something new for these men. I could see some people watching this thinking, what you're learning is, are such simple, kind of basic... But for, for an addict and alcoholic... It's not so basic when, when your first priority was drinking and drugging. You got to pay your rent. You got to clean this. You got to do that. And you got to be considerate of other people. And I'm, I didn't pay my rent on time. I got evicted from a lot of places. I didn't bathe regularly, you know, and it's something that I do here. From the time that we picked up our first drug, we stopped growing mentally and physically. We stopped. Now that we trying to get ourselves sober and clean again, we had to start from the time mentally the time that we started the drugs. So what's normal for you is not is new to us. Doing your chores is an essential part of recovery. In a women's Oxford house in Washington, D.C., the house coordinator makes sure that everyone pulls her own weight. Oh, my goodness. Look at this. See who just washed. I'm going to hold on to this lint and see who's going to cop to it. <laughs> Whoever dried clothes last, the filter was filthy and what I want to ask now it does the uh, person who did not clean the dry want to cop to it next time there will be a fine initiated of fifty dollars so fifty dollar fine for leaving some lint in the dry yes, our fines are fifty dollars and I just got one <laughs> I say that because <laughs> You're the one who's supposed to be making sure all the chores are done, and you yeah. got a fine? Mm -hmm. I got a fine. I was not responsible for taking out my trash. <laughs> the coordinator is the most feared person in Oxford House. Why is that, that the most feared person? Because they can... They, they're the one who's looking at your real behavior. A lot of times you can relapse way before you pick up the drink or the drug, and a lot of people can see the behavior. Mm -hmm. Malloy says not only doing chores, but holding an elected office helps to make a person responsible. I think that this is where we stumbled into a very good system in an Oxford House. It, it's democratically run. Some of the individuals in the House are elected to president, secretary, treasurer. And that's important because it says, this peer group has enough faith in me to believe I can take the minutes of this meeting. 
or even more importantly, they believe I can be trusted with the money and, and run the house checking account. It's a message Malloy and his people carry around the country. My forte was writing forged checks, and um, there they voted me the treasurer comptroller of the house, and I said to them, do you know who I am? And they said, yes, we do. I said, wow, if these girls believe I can do it, that made me believe that I could do it, you know? So it helped a lot. Andrea has been clean for over two years, after several years on crack and 20 years on heroin. She is now on the board of directors of Oxford House, which makes her Paul Malloy's boss, one more example of the inmates running the asylum. When she and Malloy travel the country telling people about recovery in Oxford Houses, one of the things their audience likes to hear is that it doesn't cost the taxpayers a penny. Malloy claims a success rate of 75%. Still, there are those who relapse, and when that happens, the House residents who voted them in kick them out. But they're family, I thought at that point. Our sobriety comes first. That's what makes this thing work. Sobriety's first, no matter what. Even if it means tossing out a family? That's then? right. No matter what. Mm -hmm. They know that when they come in here. They use bye-bye. So you would have no problem slamming the door in Alona's face if no. you found out she was... No. Okay. It almost sounds too simple. It is. It is. But that's what is important for individuals in the community at large to understand. That addiction is treatable, and it's not going to cost them a lot of money. But it is going to cost them tolerance and understanding. Folks who are not alcoholics and who are not drug addicts will never be able to understand why somebody like me has to drink until the bottle's empty. But what you can do is to get people who are not alcoholics and drug addicts to understand that like the prodigal son, they can come back into the community and function well if society will let them back into the community. You can't take the newly recovering person and put them in the crack neighborhood where they were using crack. You gotta open houses and rent houses in good neighborhoods. When you finally got out of treatment, Mark, could you have come back to this area, to this neighborhood? You no. Know, that's one thing I learned in treatment. They said you have to change your people, your places, and your things. So I knew I couldn't come back to this negative environment. Well, it, what, what would have happened if you'd come back here? Well, I'd have fell right back into the same syndrome, guys, same people that have been around me all the time, and uh, eventually I would have went back and picked up. Mark Spence hasn't picked up crack or a drink in over two years. Now he's using his sobriety as a selling point in convincing landlords to rent out their homes for Oxford houses in good neighborhoods. Basically what I do is just tell them my story. I tell them that it's because of a neighborhood allowing an Oxford house to be there that allowed me the chance to grow. And now look what I'm doing. And I'm asking you for the same opportunity for people in your, in your area. We're the best people you can live next to. I mean, we're quiet. We keep the house up. Paul Malloy himself lived in an Oxford house for two and a half years. Now sober for 16 years, his goal is to make sure there is an Oxford house for everyone who needs it. Malloy was able to convince his old friends on Capitol Hill of that. He used his connections to get legislation passed so that states can now loan former alcoholics and addicts the money they need up front to rent a place for recovery. Most individuals who took the road I took of, of becoming an alcoholic and, and followed that path uh, end up with sad, sad endings. Uh, God's been good to me. I've ended up with a happy ending. You remarried. We did? Two years ago. Two years ago. After how many years being divorced? 75. 13. 80. Yeah, 13 years. Mm -hmm. Couple and the years. the fact of the matter is that when he's not drinking, he's a nice guy that uh, I married the first time. And a shrewd guy. When you remarry your wife and she moves in with you, what do you do with her old house? If you're Paul Malloy, the answer is obvious. How long after you moved out did your old home become an Oxford house? Immediately. <laughs> you don't miss a beat, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. 